Miskatonic University launches a scientific expedition to the Antarctic. I'm Nathan Reed for Worldwide Wireless News. A team from Arkham's Miskatonic University, financed by the Nathaniel Derby Pickman Foundation, embarked with high excitement on a research expedition to the frozen South Pole. Leading the expedition are Professors Frank Peabody, Atticus Lake, Leonard Atwood, and William Dyer. Departing from Boston, the scientists plan to use special apparatus to drill through ice and snow into the ancient rock for evidence of the flora and fauna that once lived on this largely unknown continent. The sea party was commanded by Captain J.B. Douglas. The professors were accompanied by seven graduate students, nine mechanics, and a pack of 55 Alaskan sled dogs. In addition to their specialized geologic equipment, the expedition carried five aeroplanes carefully designed for landing on snow and ice. The brig Arkham and the bark Miskatonic carried the expedition through the Panama Canal to Hobart, Tasmania, where the expedition took on its final supplies. From there, they sailed through iceberg-laden waters until they reached McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. Miskatonic University expedition landed on Ross Island in Antarctica and set up a base camp for the expedition's future work. Men and dogs worked together to unload aeroplanes and a season's worth of equipment and supplies at the foot of Mount Erebus, an active volcano. November is summertime in Antarctica, with round-the-clock daylight. Penguins, seals, and other local wildlife didn't seem to mind the expedition's presence at all. While waiting for pack ice to break up, the crew took advantage of the temporary halt to replenish their supply of fresh water by pumping it from pools in the ice field. With base camp fully established, the expedition took geologic samples from nearby mountains before flying some 700 miles south to set up an advanced camp. With the use of their experimental ice melting and drilling equipment, the expedition was able to excavate numerous fossils, proving conclusively that life was once abundant in this now barren wasteland. In addition to discovering fossils, expedition member Professor Frank Peabody, accompanied by graduate students Gedney and Carroll, climbed to the summit of Mount Nansen, one of Antarctica's tallest peaks at 13,350 feet above sea level. The expedition used their aeroplanes to take samples from many parts of the southernmost continent, helping us to better understand the prehistory of this unknown world. The scientists reported their discoveries to fascinated listeners in special radio broadcasts, sponsored by Arkham Newspapers. A Miskatonic crew flew directly over the South Pole in two of the expedition's aeroplanes. Buffeted by high winds, the expedition was forced to ground its planes for over an hour, but the intrepid scientists built a snow shelter for the craft and before long were in the skies again. 
the expedition's Professor Peabody made this wireless transmission from the air. Gentlemen and folks listening back at home, according to our radio compass, we are now flying directly over the South Pole. We bow our heads in memory of Captain Scott and the other British explorers who paid the ultimate price to come here before us. While the sudden storms of the Antarctic summer proved difficult for the expedition's aeroplanes, the scientists were well supplied and in high spirits. Discovery of a highly unusual fossil sample led biologist Professor Lake to change the expedition's itinerary in order to explore regions northwest of their original position. This fossil may have been a footprint of sorts from an era hundreds of millions of years before such highly evolved life was thought to exist. The search for similar specimens led them to regions of Antarctica never before seen by human beings. While flying in aeroplanes to look for rare geologic samples, researchers from Miskatonic University discovered what may be the tallest mountains on the planet. Mechanical problems with one of the aeroplanes caused Lake and his team to land on a glacier at the foothills of the mighty peaks. While mechanics worked on repairs, the scientists had a look around. Using a theodolite, Professor Atwood measured the tallest peak at over 34,000 feet, which would dwarf Mount Everest by some 5,000 feet of altitude. The awestruck scientists reported mirages and queer skyline effects caused by some kind of crystallization clinging to the highest peaks. Researchers followed up the tremendous mountain discovery with a treasure trove of fossils. After pursuing a northwestward course under the leadership of Professor Atticus Lake, the team melted through a layer of thin, wind-blown ice and began drilling the Antarctic rock for fossil samples. The use of dynamite exposed a limestone cave, yielding a dazzling array of specimens covering a vast span of prehistory from 25 million to 500 million years ago. The men of science believed their discovery suggested whole cycles of life on the planet before the earliest ones mankind has ever known, and would mean to biology what Einstein has meant to physics and mathematics. The remains of strange barrel-shaped organisms, unidentifiable as either plant or animal, were of greatest significance and were removed from the ice and transported back to the advance camp of Professor Lake for further study. The biologists compared them in some ways to primitive crinoids, ancient sea-dwelling creatures with numerous arms, and in other ways to giant starfish. Strange discoveries indeed. To describe their fantastic qualities, the men of science could refer only to mythological creatures mentioned in ancient books and called them the Elder Things. Then, at the height of this scientific excitement, Disaster struck the expedition. Shortly after announcing its tremendous discoveries, Professor Lake's advance camp at the foot of the mighty mountains dropped from all radio contact. Professor Dyer and the other men back at the base camp hoped it was merely equipment trouble or the interference of the fierce polar winds. But after numerous hours without communication, the reserve aeroplanes were brought in from McMurdo Sound and loaded with dogs, sledges, and supplies for a rescue operation. They discovered only heartbreak. Professor Dyer made this wireless transmission from the scene. My team arrived at the Miskatonic advance camp at 1600 hours. The entire camp appears to have been destroyed in a massive storm. It's pure devastation here. We're searching the area and have a look the bodies of 11 men. We're using the plane to search for the 12th member of their group. The world mourns the loss of these brave men who gave their lives in the shadow of these mountains of misery.